It's Halloween in July. Pledge to get on my apron. Pledge yearly to get a patch or even your own apron. Cool, we got that done. It's time for the good stuff. Stay Out of the House is that grungy horror game straight out of the grindhouse that's spooky and a lot of fun to just play. It's got the spookies, the stealth, the puzzles. TLDR, best in show at 15 bucks. This is an absolute steal. I was gonna have this be an indie ween title, but after Darkest Dungeon grinded up all the time I had to prep these videos, I needed something with a reasonable runtime and that was still a spooky good time and you know what puppet combo has delivered in spades Puppet Combo is an indie developer that's sometimes just one person, sometimes a few people. They got their start with lots of smaller horror titles on itch.io that developed a pretty impressive following to the point where I had to tap out on letting the credits roll at the end of the game just because they have so many patrons to thank. Not gonna lie, a little jealous there. Stay Out of the House isn't Puppet Combo's first major Steam release, but it's arguably one of their most ambitious games. Of the inspirations they list on their website, among all the old horror franchises Puppet Combo has there, Deus Ex is in there too, and that vibe of player creativity is totally here. It's definitely one of those you can do that games where even if you play it a ton there's so much stuff that you'll just discover through achievements or other things that you didn't even think of like how wire cutters can also be used to disable all the cameras that the guy puts up or how people figured out later on that if you're feeling especially brave you can use a hammer to loudly break down a door negating need to find out how to unlock it by going through the house we're getting ahead of ourselves though so let's get into that gameplay so the main game starts with you waking up in a cage with a tv that you just can't turn off with some weird televangelist broadcast on it. You gotta get out of here. You've gotta avoid traps, making loud noises, granny, and the big man himself while you try to figure out just how the heck you get that front door open. This is gonna require a lot of sneaking and puzzle solving with some adventure game style stuff thrown in there. And it's a good idea to know when to stand your ground. You are not a super commando. The house is not a big open place where there are plenty of spaces to hide. And if you piss off the big guy a little too much, you'll start like flipping beds and stuff so you can't hide under those anymore. You can get got pretty much anywhere in this place because this is the bad guy's home turf. Stay out of the house very much follows that survival horror formula with some adventure elements that were established in the first amnesia game. You have a limited everything. Limited inventory spaces, a limited amount of saves, and only one place you can save. And you are not Chris Redfield. You're some little passenger princess that got a little too eepy on a road trip to the severe detriment of the person riding with her. It's uh, gonna take quite a bit before you're even in a spot to try and fend off the butcher and it's not something that you can do more than once in rapid succession. If you want to reload your gun that you find in this game, you gotta focus in on it, pop the cylinder open, manually take out any spent cartridges, and then individually put the new ones back in. You also need to be mindful of where you're loading the cartridges because you can accidentally put rounds in the wrong chamber and when the butcher notices you, you're gonna be desperately mashing that trigger wondering where the heck that bullet is. Also, you gotta be real careful because you will misfire this thing and end up attracting everyone in the house that wants to kill you to your location. Only have this gun equipped when you are ready to fire it. There are effectively no situations where combat is ideal in Stay Out of the House. Stealth is king, and as far as I know, there are no situations where you need to start a fight to get to or do something. And aside from like maybe one specific scenario where it's better to remove a patrolling enemy so it can't alert the big guy, combat should be reserved for when you get spotted and can't run away. Most of the time it's pretty easy to just duck into a vent or something to elude the butcher, but it's best to break line of sight before you do that because if he knows you're in there, he'll turn on the spicy gas. You can also turn it off once he's gone, but you also can't save or use the vents as a safe hiding place until you get that gas off, so you might find yourself in a bad spot. Stay out of the house is a game where you gotta be creative with your resources if you wanna get by. You can manage your inventory by leaving items in the safe room since they don't despawn. You can dis arm and even reset the bear traps which will usually be a guaranteed disengagement from the butcher if you set them up somewhere and leave them for him to walk into. Maybe find that backpack so you can get a few extra inventory spaces which will make certain puzzles a lot easier to solve. Do not play for combat, play for avoiding it. Now of course we're gonna have some good old horror puzzles. Most of these fall that try it and true, get the thing to interface with object but you need to uh, figure out where you can get the thing to get the thing all while managing the enemies around the base or in this case, the house. Sometimes it's figuring out how to get a hex key so you can pick locks and open up a massive portion of this game's item pool. Sometimes it's seeing how much flesh you'll need to pile into a food scale to break it. Sometimes it's breaking into a car. 
there are some straight up like puzzle puzzles if you play certain routes, like the dreaded tile puzzle right here, but that's an outlier. And uh, the bread and butter of the game is that like horror logic puzzle, like the fun stuff. The biggest puzzle in any game like this is trying not to die. Spooky time. The spookies in this game start before we're even in the main game. Stay out of the house's main game isn't even the first episode. It's actually the third. We'll get to the first in a bit, but for now we'll talk about the second, the prologue. The prologue has you starting out on a road trip with your boyfriend here, and you stop at a rest area so he can use the bathroom. You conk out for a sec, but rather than wake up on the road again, you are still in the rest area and your buddy is nowhere to be found. Sucks for you that while he wasn't in the bathrooms, you do discover his driver's license near a trail leading off away from the road. What follows is an extremely intense walk through the cornfields looking for your boyfriend where things become increasingly unsettling as you go deeper and deeper into the crops. Cornfields have been done before in horror like Outlast 2, and personally I think they're underutilized in games. Having a huge field of plants just tall enough to where you effectively have no peripheral vision is great. It's hard to tell where you are or where you're going, but you do eventually find a guide and he doesn't take you to the nicest of places. The prologue wraps up with you going into the house after the dog, and while it's not nearly as bad as it is in the main game, something is very wrong here. Oh yeah, and someone uh, locked the door behind you shortly after you came in. Things get wild for a sec, and then you wake up in the cage that you'll start the main game in. Like, geez, the prologue alone is spookier than a lot of games I see these days, and we are not even into the main game. Now let's talk about the guy who just vibe-checked you with a hammer and then threw you in a cage. The Butcher. Never mind that he's already a big ol', most likely quite literally corn-fed dude before he started craving the forbidden jerky, he's nuts. The butcher only communicates in psychotic squeals, and the only time you hear them is when he's in pain or if he's about to put you in a whole lot of pain. Other than that, the only noises he makes are the sounds of him aggressively meal prepping or slowly stomping around the house. Those are some very important noises, by the way. Listen closely so that you can tell when he's meal prepping or when he's stretching his legs, because sometimes you're gonna need to go into that kitchen and you do not want want to be in there while he's in there. The Butcher also has a couple helpers like Granny, who theoretically you'll never have to deal with because she's distracted with her infomercials. And then there's also the very bad dog. The dog hangs around in the backyard and can be entirely avoided pretty easily, but if he does see you, I hope you have a fully re loaded revolver and some ammo to spare because getting in a fight with a dog guarantees a fight with the Butcher. Oh yeah, and also you might have noticed that he's wearing a burlap sack over his head and is covered in blood and that he's eating anyone who hangs out at that red stop for too long. Yeah, uh, the odds are not in your favor here. Again, this is not a game where you can just like shoot your way through things. And then we've got the namesake house itself, which is full of the butcher's handiwork. There's a lot of very, um, thrifty decoration choices here, as well as a bunch of other alarming things like the mannequins. You are not alone anywhere in this house, even when you think you are. There's something else other than the butcher, granny, or even the dog that's making the radar go off, and even if everyone's accounted for, it's most likely moving through the vents like you do. It's not the little baby either because it would seem that this little guy's a little too small to set off the radar. Also, there's something really weird going on with you ever since you got into this house. The player character frequently complains about her stomach feeling awful, which she initially attributes to the butcher's hammer, but that wouldn't explain the blacking out or the weird visions you're getting. They're in your face for less than a second, but they're unsettling to say the least. Is it this house? Is it something in the house? Didn't you see a sign somewhere saying this was a fallout shelter? What's with all these weird televangelist broadcasts? What the heck is in that basement? Before we answer any of these questions though, I think it's time for our cooking segment. Today we're going to do a California burrito, or at least my sad attempt at it, as I am far away from home and what I'd normally expect to be readily available to me is something I have to reverse engineer myself. Cali burritos are usually done with carne asada, but can really use any kind of meat. What you absolutely cannot compromise on is the use of french fries. You must use crinkle fries. Any other choice in french fry is WRONG! The crinkle fries provide the surface area and texture to allow for maximum flavor and crunch, and I don't care how fancy your bespoke whatever the shit fries are, if they are not crinkle fries going in your burrito, you are doing it wrong. 
Tangents aside, let's get the meat prep. We're gonna be marinating our meats here, so start this either the night before or the morning of the meal you're gonna have your burritos in. I went with a thin sliced steak here, which I would not recommend. Personally, I think the flank steak or even some thin sirloin slices would have been better than this stuff because while it did say it was for carne asada on the package, I swear this is like 50% tended. Whatever. Our base for this marinade is olive oil, similar to how we started the Lomo Saltado, and that's about where things end. We're gonna be using a combination of lime juice and orange juice for flavor here, and then the usual suspects. So I guess that's another way it's kind of like the Saltado. Get the fine stuff chopped, mix up some jalapenos, and uh, don't take out the innards this time because we want that flavor and heat to transfer into the steak, and then put everything into a bag and then put that bag in a bowl in the fridge until it is time. Now we're gonna do the fixins. We're gonna be putting in the crinkle fries, some guac, or since I was lazy, just some avocado spread, cheese, and crema into the burrito with the carne asada. We only really need to prep two of these things, and then a third thing we're literally just throwing into the oven during the cook. All right, we'll start with that avocado spread. It's about a couple steps away from actual guac, and I'm just here mashing up some avocados, and then adding salt, pepper, and a bit of green onions to taste. This is arguably guacamole, but if this is your definition of guac, I really hope you expand your horizons because you deserve better. Mash it up real good, salt and pepper to taste, and then cover it up with some plastic wrap so it does not get brown before it's time to cook. Moving on. As for crema, I read up on this since I haven't really done it before and opted for one part sour cream, one part buttermilk for simplicity's sake before grating some lime zest in there. This is probably wrong, but it came out tasting pretty good after I whisked it all together and it went into the squeeze bottle no problem. All right, it's showtime. Preheat your oven to whatever it says on the crinkle fries bag and get those in before getting your pan nice and hot. Normally this would go on a grill, but I live in an apartment and therefore am cursed to be unable to grill. If this is the case for you, remember to not use cast iron here because we do have acidic stuff in this marinade, which will leach from the pan. That is bad. This part is really straightforward. Get your meat out, throw it in the pan, turning once since this is pretty thin meat and cooks quick, get it out to rest, do the next one. Do these one at a time because we don't want to crowd the pan and dilute the heat. And speaking of which, give it like maybe a minute between uh, doing steaks so that the pan also has time to get back up to top heat. By the time you're done searing the last one of these, the first one you cooked should be rested enough for you to start cutting it into thin strips. And would you look at that? The meat's all done. All we gotta do now is pull out the fries and assemble this bad boy. Get your pan clean and then keep it on a low heat for a bit while we assemble. Now, normally what you one is called a restaurant sized tortilla, which I believe come in like the purple package. And they're usually available in the store just sometimes, like the time I went to the store, they are out of stock. So you have to settle for normal burrito sized tortillas and then just double up. Don't go asking local restaurants for their big tortillas. The kitchens have enough problems on their hands without some guy coming in and asking to buy their stock before the dinner rush starts. What we're gonna do here is take the tortillas, cover the entire surface area of them with cheese, and then throw them on the pan for just long enough for that cheese to start start melting. No more, no less. You take them off, and if you're a hungry boy like me, you double them up by having them overlap slightly so that when you roll them together, they fuse. The cheese will help with this a lot. Now the stacking order goes on top of the cheese, avocado spread, carne asada, crema, fries. That way the fries stay kind of dry in the center and the meat, cheese, and guac can all combine to do their thing. Now, you either slice this in half to be all fancy as you plate it up with some chips, or you make a monstrosity like me and drown this thing in enchilada sauce and more crema. And you're done. Now let's get out of that house now. Before we get into the story details of Stay Out of the House, there's a couple things I want to go over, like episode one of the game. Episode one is called The Night Shift and is mostly unrelated to the main story. It's just you playing as a convenience store worker who gets dropped off for an overnight shift. You've got a few tasks to do, but something is a little, um, suspicious. As a guy that's worked a lot of night shifts in his time, this really nails it. There's that unease of being on your own for a while, being so bored for most of the night that you actually do the things you are assigned to do, or sometimes even intentionally hold off on them to give you something to do later in the night when things get really slow. There's a real edge in night shifts. You have no idea who's coming in and when they're going, and it's pretty dark out and people do weird stuff in the dark. Most places will make it to where there's almost always at least two people on the job at any time for night shifts since the buddy system is one of the best deterrents for mischief, but they can't have that coverage for every hour of the day unless they want some DM who's never been up past midnight in his life breathing down their neck. Like for a while, I had to do late nights at a valet lot in Anaheim and even with the guys at the hotel 30 feet away, 
day, my head was on a swivel every night. Lucky for me, the only thing I really saw were a handful of Walt Disney divorces whenever a mom discovered that dad had wandered off to downtown Fullerton for a bit of mischief instead of doing whatever Mickey Mouse bullshit family fun activity they had planned for the night. We're getting sidetracked here though, and I don't want to go into the rabbit hole of like all the dark stuff late night pizza guys see. The Night Shift is one of the best slow burns I've played. 99% of it is just nothing, but it's that existence of the 1% that you know is coming that will set you on edge. I think you can find the person from the Night Shift later in the main game though, but I'm not so sure. And yes, because many have brought it to my attention in that respect, stay out of the house can indeed be considered an immersive sim. There's lots of cool tricks you can do, like the stuff previously mentioned earlier in the video, like disabling cameras or breaking doors, plus other stuff. You can go out into the yard and free the people the busher is trapped. You can bring them to the safe room to keep them safe for a while, or if you're feeling absolutely cold-blooded, you can use them as bait to save yourself. Stealth is ideal, but combat is always an option, and there is rarely ever only one way to get into a locked room or complete a task. There's also all the superficial things like vents to crawl through and coves to find, so have fun with that. Okay, story time, you guys know what to do. There's nothing too crazy going on here from the outset. The prologue happens and then you're in the house. Time to get out. Along the way, we see what happens to your traveling companion and anyone else that the butcher finds as you realize that you are one of many who have been abducted in this area before finally realizing that Granny ordered that canning thing from the infomercial she's always watching all day and put the key to the front door in one of the cans. You traverse the house to find enough batteries to turn on the can opener and you get the hell out. Or do you? There are four different endings in this game. One is where you lose all your continues, one for the basic ending, and one for if you get a little too curious about what's down that hall. And the supposed best ending is the final one. The basic ending is you get out of the house, having one last chase with a butcher where he finds his chainsaw, and as you go to the house of that one guy who walked into the convenience store to buy a beer in the night shift, leading me to believe that one of the people in the cages is indeed the player character from episode one, and a lot of people have theorize that this guy is also some sort of accomplice to the butcher, uh, things get a little bit wiggly. If you want the other endings, you gotta find your way into the secret door in the basement. Assuming you do that, you'll discover that there is an entire underground complex below the house where people were doing some pretty sketchy experiments before something got out. It seems like something is still working on whatever is down here in the bunker because there's a version of the butcher down here with a gas mask instead of a burlap sack, as well as just wearing like a full boiler suit as if he's trying to like keep things kind of sterile. Also, demon dog comes down here too. I don't know what's worse, the idea that the butcher is down here doing all this stuff or that there are potentially two butchers. I only even mention that latter part because one of the things that happens as you go into the bunker is the butcher locks the only way in or out of the bunker behind you. You know all those weird televangelist shows that are everywhere in the house? Well, it turns out they were being filmed down here and were part of some sort of experiment to do things to people. It seems beneficial at first until whatever happened with the butcher happened, except it gets weirder. There's also some sort of entity down here that's formed a sort of pact with the butcher for food, and the only thing that can be done to stop it is to overload the bunker's reactor in this facility in hopes of killing it. I gotta be honest here, if there is some big overarching story, I don't see it. Between the monster supposedly eating people, the chicken and the egg scenario with the lab and the monster, where it's mentioned that like some of the people can hear screams from the lowest level of the lab that are working there, but they won't say what they're doing, or even with all the notes and checking the wiki, things feel a bit disconnected. And you know what? Possibly on purpose, hearkening back to slasher films where not a lot of stuff made sense and uh, hey, we gotta keep making sequels indefinitely, so we're gonna have some continuity issues eventually. Like, even if we try to string together that like the butcher somehow just happened to have his property like on top of the bunker or that he possibly moved there and that the scientists were working with the entity or working on the entity for a while until it got the better of them and it formed a pack with the butcher. Even if we string all that together and then have the idea that yes, the butcher is helping the entity get food, that doesn't explain the parasite thing. Uh, unless there's like some huge swath of information I'm missing, but at this point, I don't scrutinize like game stories too much, especially horror games, because um, man, there's just so much, like especially as mascot horror has gotten really into just having that shit insane stories. There's a lot of stuff that just feels impossibly opaque, meant for people to spend a hundred hours doing like supreme, like 
college thesis level analyses on. And I'm not really here for that. I gotta be honest. Um, and I'm also possibly thinking maybe it is intentionally made with weird, somewhat contradicting factors in the story. Just a mess with the people that try to do that. And if that is the case, I am 100% here for that. I don't know. Tell me in the comments if there is a coherent story, but like put some spoiler warnings on that stuff. And that's it. State of the House is a hell of a good horror game with some solid gameplay and spookies. It's a bit of a fever dream at times, and it's wild with those unsettling Quake-style graphics where everything's just a little wiggly, but that just adds to the spice of it. At $14.99, this is a bargain beyond bargains, and I'd suggest this above everything else that I've shown you in Halloween July. Remember that we got those cool spooky specials over at Patreon, where everyone who pledges gets on the new patron apron, and the yearly pledges get their own iron-on patch, or even their own patron apron with their name embroidered onto it by yours truly. Screw middlemen fulfillment companies, I do everything myself. Now let's sign off. Remember that no matter what you do, be it writing stories, dressing up as your favorite characters for conventions, wood carving, or whatever, what you do is not content. It is art. Content is a word that has been twisted into meaning to grind up everything you do into meaningless gray slop so some line can go up for someone else's benefit. You are better than that. Your art is a product of all your passions, your skills, and experiences, and is an inalienable reflection of yourself by the nature of its creation. So you are better than content. Fight for your art, because when you do so, you fight for yourself. Stay sassy, everyone. Sir? Why are you in my dominion? This is the kitchen. Where I make food. Like stock for the big soup. Which really, I gotta hurry up and stir this all in. Because I just dumped all... Okay, there we go. The seasonings and stuff on the top. And, uh, yeah, that needs to mix in. I've got, like, three weeks of meal prep worth of, like, spare chicken bones in here. Because, like, I buy the chicken quarters whole, cut them up, make them into meal preps. And then I take all the bones and skin and stuff, save that in the, um, freezer. Until I got enough to make a big soup. But we're getting distracted here. Where's the boy gone? This lad, he is on the run. Where is he? Seriously, where is he? He's not in the office. Not in the shitter. Found him. Living room boy. Why were you screaming in the kitchen? The children are screaming outside. Is it just small creature screaming hour? You've got your flat yogurt box. Don't you want to sit on it? Give it some sits. Are there any thoughts in that head? Retreat to the box. Or no, retreat to the entryway. All right, cool. Bye.